start. We'll just we'll just start. We have a small enough crowd that I think it's it's okay. But anyway, since the speaker is grounded in the CMB. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but for those who are going to be watching the instant replay on the video, I am Doug Green. I am a co communist historian. I hope that's not controversial. And. Uh, this is lecture four of the Red History Lecture Series. The other videos are online. So it's uh, August Blanqui, Caracas Babuf, and Victor Serge. And the following ones after this for June and July, respectively, are Tanya Bunk, who was a, a guerrilla in South America, and uh, Nikolai Bukharin, who is a Bolshevik theorist who is still innocent. Um, th but today, we're going to talk about Bazan Jazani and the Iranian Fedayeen. Um, which is a Iranian communist group. And if you've seen the other lectures, which most of you here have, this is structured a little differently because I didn't actually have as much biographical material. And uh, I didn't actually write the book on this one. So it was, it's a little different. And forgive me as I go through it if I don't, I don't actually have to pronounce a lot of Iranian names. It's the one thing to write them. It's another thing to actually try and pronounce them. So forgive, them. forgive me if I mess that up. Uh, I, well, there is some, uh, I kind of go, I was talking to a friend the other day about who was active in the, the, 70, uh, the 60s and 70s. He actually said, you know, they were a well-known group, even though I'm trying to rather obscure people. And I think it kind of comes out, hopefully in the talk, why this is important. Because, uh, but you can feel free to ask during the question and answer. And if you know, some of you who may know a little, aspects of Iran, like, just because I don't want to throw a bunch of facts at you and talk for an hour and a half, I'm not going to go into groups like the Muvachadin, a lot of the Maoists or Trotskys, who admittedly were important, or at least the Maoists, where I don't think the Trotskys so much, but, um, anyway, if you want to bring that up during question and answer. So the, the talk is Devotion and Resistance, Bazanja Zani and the Iranian Fedayeen. And the popular image of the Iranian Revolution in the United States focuses on a series of stereotypical bearded mullahs, an exotic and backward oriental society, and of course the seizure of the U.S. Embassy by frenzied masses. While it is true that the current government of Iran is a theocratic Islamic state that hijacked the revolution that brought down the U.S. back shock, that is not the whole story. There's another story of brave and dedicated communist revolutionaries who sought the liberation of their people from capitalism, imperialism, and the establishment of a revolutionary socialist state. Communists like the brilliant Bazan Jazani, who thought seriously and sincerely about how to make a revolution in Iran. Jazani, like so many of his generation, was willing to go the distance for the communist cause, paying the ultimate price in the end. It is true that they did not succeed, both due to their own errors and to those they had no control over. Despite that, they, and not the clerics of Iran, deserve to be honored, warts and all. And it is, their, it is the story of their struggle that they endured and the revolution, and this is the story of their struggle, their endurance, and the revolution they dreamed of. Now, Bazan Jazani was born in 1937 into both a Jewish family and a political family. His father was a member of the Judea, or the Communist Party of Iran, and I'll use those terms interchangeably. And at the age of 10, he joined the party's youth wing. As he grew older, Jazani displayed a keen philosophical mind which would lead him to take a degree in the subject. He also showed a greater knowledge of Iranian history and a keen, independent, and non-dogmatic thought in his approach to revolution. Although Jazani would always remain a Marxist-Leninist, he ultimately believed that Judea, the Judea party was not the appropriate vehicle to carry out a revolution. Like many of his radical contemporaries, Jazani broke with the party and sought to forge a new communist path. Jazani's break with the Judea can be traced to the party's response to the 1953 U.S.-backed coup that overthrew Mohammed Mossadegh. Key to understanding these events is the role of oil, as it always seems to be. Although the oil industry produced a great deal of wealth, the profits swelled the coffers of British oil companies, and almost none of this went to the Iranian government or to the workers on the oil fields, whose strikes were brutally suppressed. The country remains subservient and dependent on imperialism, and most of the countryside was governed by feudal property relations. There was some development of Iranian infrastructure and industry under the monarchy, 
Following World War II, the Shah was driven from power, and there was an opening for change. In 1951, Mossadegh and his National Front came to power, promising to nationalize the oil industry and to break the chains of imperialist dependency. There was a massive swell of nationalist support for the National Front's program, not only among the national bourgeoisie, but from the working class and the Trudea. The working class pressed for even more political and economic changes than the government was willing to deliver, and they began strikes and demonstrations. The Judea, a critical supporter of the government, was also tied to the Soviet Union, who did not want to destabilize the friendly Iran, and they feared, it, and they feared an independent mass movement and worked to defuse the uh, developing radical move, the Judea. Yet the opposition among the comprador bourgeoisie, the throne, Britain, and the United States were determined to bring down the National Front. And in 1953, they staged a successful coup, which restored the Shah to his throne, the oil company of the British, and American companies. The Today was unable to rent the coup for a multitude of reasons. Their dependence on the Soviet Union, lack of initiative among their leaders, factionalism, and a complete failure to use their members organized in the armed forces. In the aftermath, the Judea was hit hard by repression, and many of the end, although it's true many of their members did heroically resist, overall they had given up the struggle without ever engaging in battle. The new regime of the Shah was completely subordinate to American imperialist interests in the region. A ruthless dictatorship was established, benefiting primarily the throne and a small comprador bourgeoisie who kept the country in a state of dependency and misery. The Shah created his notorious secret police force, the Savak, which jailed, tortured, and murdered thousands. And the primary victims of the Shah's repression, and I should emphasize this, fell on its secular opponents, nationalists and communists. Yet opposition remained and exploded into the open in 1963, when mass demonstrations erupted against the Shah's arrest of the outspoken Ayatollah Khomeini. These demonstrations were quickly suppressed by the army. Repression was stepped up by the Shah, and the last openings for dissent were closed off. The Trudea failed to organize during these protests. And this event had a profound effect on Jazani and his co-thinkers, producing a major change in their tactics. During the 50s, Jazani would, was actually going in and out in jail. He was going to school. He did get married. But you know, he did maintain a link to the party. But by this point, he was breaking with it. So following 1963 and the break with the, the, Tudea, uh, the Tudea party, Jazani and fellow radicals were influenced by their readings on revolutions in Algeria, Vietnam, China, and Cuba, and they concluded that armed struggle was the only way forward. For the next several years, Jazani and his comrades prepared for the task ahead, organizing cells and demonstrations against the regime. However, Jazani had little experience in underground activity or armed action. And in February 1968, he was captured by the Savak and imprisoned. Along with Jazani, most of the leading members of his group were arrested. Yet a few of them managed to escape the police dragnet, and they continued the task of organizing. Two members managed to leave Iran for Lebanon, where they joined the Palestinian Liberation Movement to receive both training and arms. Other comrades remained in Iran to reorganize and recruit members, and to prepare for the initiation of armed action in both the cities and the countryside. In 1970, the remnants of Jazani's organization made contact with another group of Marxists led by uh, Musad Amizdeya and Amir Parviz Puyam. These activists were younger from religious backgrounds, less experienced, and little exposed to Marx Marxist theory, although they did show an affinity for Maoism. Initially, this group organized cells in the, in the universities and developed links with other revolutionary intellectuals, such as Baruz Kani, who was later savagely tortured and killed by the Savak, without revealing any names. Between 1968 and 1971, this group developed their own agrarian reform program and a theory of urban guerrilla warfare influenced by Carlos Margliela, Regis Debray, and Che Guevara. In 1971, the armed struggle officially began with an attack on the northern police force of Sevecal. Twelve guerrillas made up the strike force that launched this bold operation. The attack was a military defeat with most of the guerrillas either captured or killed. Yet it was a political and immoral victory, sparking other groups, both Islamic and Marxist, to take up the gun and frightening the Shah and showing that his rule would not go unchallenged. Two months later, the initiators of the armed struggle formed a revolutionary communist group known as the Organization of Iranian People's Fedayeen Guerrillas. 
Before discussing some of the political line struggles of the Fedayeen, we should state that they lived up to the name Fedayeen, which means self-sacrifice. For the next eight years, the Fedayeen would be in the hills and the cities, fighting the armed forces of the Shah, guns in hand. Now, there were two major political lines in the Fedayeen, that of Piyan and his co-thinkers, and the other of Jizani. Piyan and his co-thinkers elaborated their position in a number of works. Their ideas, their positions were very simple. The repression of the Shah had lulled the masses into a state of apathy which made it impossible for the Fedayeen to establish firm links with the working class. They argued in opposition to the Judea party, who believed that a passive theory of survival, who believed in a, in a passive theory of survival, whereby a radicals need to hold their organization together, press for small reforms, and wait for better days when political struggle could be conducted. Puyan and, and his comrades summed up the Judea's position as both defeatist and reformist, and they said in a very ironic tone, and I quote, what we do, and this is summarizing their view of the two days position, what we do is to adopt a number of reformist measures, gather strength, ask the regime to speed up its positive steps, and try and force it into some tactical concessions. The main task is not the overthrow of the Shah dictatorship and replacement with a people's dictatorship, but is to ask for the gradual change of the Shah's dictatorship into the Shah's democracy. End quote. Mm -hmm. Puyan argued that the passivity of the masses could be shattered by the, by the revolutionary armed struggle, leading to the establishment of the vanguard organization of the working class. And this thesis was elaborated by other co-thinkers who, who adopted a focus as a theory of armed struggle based on Regis Debray, whereby a small motor of guerrillas could ignite the larger motor of the workers. Puyan's faction also had its own socio-economic analysis of Iranian society. For instance, they believed that Iran was a dependent capitalist society with a comprador bourgeoisie tied to imperialism and the reforms of the Shah's white revolution, discussed below, were reactionary, heightening class contradictions rather than mitigating. And this created an objectively revolutionary situation. To them, the main blow of revolutionaries needed to be struck against imperialism. The state was secondary. Thus, due to the Nassayan revolutionary situation, a consistent armed struggle could produce a spontaneous mass revolt. This theory, which did not have the desired effect results, like all focus theory, was dominant in the Fedayeen until 1976, when it was finally abandoned for the ideas of Jazani. Jazani's ideas were elaborated by him in a number of works written in prison, uh, Armed Struggle in, Ar in Iran, and a collection of writings entitled Capitalism and Revolution in Iran. Now, despite the harsh conditions of prison, Jazani was able to write on a number of issues such as land reform, dependency theory, vanguard organization, and military tactics. He was also perhaps alone among Marxists in Iran in understanding the popularity of Ayatollah Khomeini. Although Jazani was a firm advocate of armed struggle, he argued that the Fedi'i needed to put the political aspect first and attempt to develop links among the working class. This was essential for victory. As he said, and I quote, the vanguard is not able to organize the masses for the revolutionary cause if it is not itself the flaring torch of, and symbol of devotion and resistance. End quote. Jazani acknowledged the Shah's white revolution had produced major changes in Iran, but believed that the land reform had eased class conflict in the countryside, meaning that a revolutionary situation did not necessarily exist. Jazani argued that the armed struggle needed to reflect this by dividing itself into two stages. During stage one, or the armed propaganda stage, revolutionaries would rise up, strike the dictatorship, organize a, a vanguard, and rally other forces to their banner. Actions would be largely propagandistic, military preparing the vanguard and politically preparing the victim, uh, people. Yet it recognized the limits of this, saying, to put too much value on sensationalist ta sensational tactics and to pay no attention to tactics that can excite the physical support of the masses for the movement can alienate the former from the latter and ultimately defeat the movement." End quote. In stage two, a, people's mass, a mass people's army would be formed, and this meant developing the second leg of the movement or giving more weight to a political movement among the workers and non-military agitation among the people. It was his belief that a revolution would be led by communists and workers, but as part of a larger alliance of classes since the working class was too small. Jusani did not believe that the national bourgeoisie was strong enough to lead the revolution, 
and that while the proletariat may ally with them, communist forces should neither surrender political independence or leadership to them in the struggle. After victory, according to Jazani's theory, Iran would have to pass through a people's democratic stage before moving on to socialism. Under a people's democracy, Iran would carry out reforms of a bourgeois and socialist nature, shattering their dependency on imperialism before moving on to socialism. It's also significant to note that Jazani also criticized the Judea party and its subservience to the Soviet Union, believing that this was detrimental to the revolutionary movement in Iran. He said, the Soviets and other powers and world movements have ignored the interests of our movement and have coordinated their relations with Iran according to their needs. And while the majority of the Fedayeen had a positive view of the Soviet Union under Stalin and a negative one of the post-Stalin era, Jazani was critical of both. By the 1960s, the Soviet Union had developed friendly relations with the Shah, which put the today in a very difficult position. China also developed close relations with the Shah in the 1970s, and the Fedayeen of the, which did have strong Mao sympathies and was more probably more Gavarist, but they maintained a, a political independence from both the Soviet Union and China. Although Chazani's line was eventually adopted by the Fedayeen in 1976, and perhaps too late since the revolutionary situation was mature, maturing, he did not live to see it. On April 18, 1975, Chazani, who was still imprisoned, was assassinated along with six other comrades by the Savak. During his time in prison, he had not only written extensively for the revolution, but practiced painting and organized resistance among his fellow inmates. With his death, Iran arguably lost one of its finest revolutionary minds and most dedicated communists. While the debates on the strategic line of the Fedayeen were being hashed out, the war against the regime raged on. During the guerrilla war, the Fedayeen lost about 170 members, but they launched nearly 2,200 operations, attacking police and army barracks, banks, informers, foreign diplomats, and industrialists. Yet the army and the secret police were able to infiltrate the Fedayeen and managed to kill or imprison nearly all of its founding members by 1975, including Kuyan. The war produced a stalemate and led to fissures among the Fedayeen with a change of line in 1976 and a pro Tudea split. Yet the Fedayeen had blazed a trail of heroism and sacrifice for the revolution in Iran. The organization managed to attract significant prestige among intellectual students and workers, emerging as the largest Marxist organization following the revolution in 1979. Even their adversary, the Shah, was forced to pay homage to the Fedayeen, saying, the determination with which they fight is quite unbelievable. Even the women keep battling to their very last gasp. The men carry cyanide tablets in their mouths and commit suicide rather than face capture. Now, during the 1960s and 70s, Vast changes came across Iran as the Shah, with the full support of his backers in Washington, began a revolution from above financed by an oil boom that was uh, known as the White Revolution, modernizing building industry and infrastructure. He nationalized forests, introduced profit sharing for workers, privatized state industry, and extended the vote for women. Vast government expenditures were spent on health care and education. At the same time, a land reform was implemented, changing class relations in the countryside, eliminating or transforming much of the old feudal landowning class. There was a vast movement of people to the cities. In 10 years from 1966 to 1976, the population of the countryside went down from 62% to less than 50. Many of these city pound peasants joined the semi-employed uh, working class, who were also rapidly growing. There was major growth in not just the comprador bourgeois uh, sections of the bourgeoisie tied to the Shah and imperialism, but to the national bourgeoisie of the bizarre merchants, shopkeepers, clergy, and entrepreneurs. Many of these sectors were profoundly religious, building mosques during the period of expansion and helping to extend the influence of the clergy to the rural population. The religious sections of the, na of the national bourgeoisie resented the westernizing influences of the Shah, along with his economic dependency on imperialism. They rallied more and more around the popular exile uh, figure, Ayatollah Khomeini. And with most avenues of protest cut off, people linked up with the Islamic opposition. Khomeini had a broad appeal to the impoverished masses, conservatives, rural poor, and the national bourgeoisie, promising an eclectic mix of social justice, patriarchy, and theocracy. On the surface, the Shah appeared to be a liberalizing. He built up an enormous military but he built up an enormous military and secret police force, along with running a notoriously corrupt regime. 
To solidify his control, he placed restrictions on merchants, created a one-party state, and subjected the clergy to state repression. The Shah's actions provoked resistance, and he responded, in turn, with brutal repression. By 1975, the oil boom had ended, and Iran was hit by, with inflation, hunger, unemployment, and falling revenues, which hit all sectors of the population, from the workers to the bourgeoisie. In 1977, open struggle began in the cities, continuing and growing rapidly through 1979. Massive strikes rocked Iran, leading to uh, worker demonstrations reminiscent of Petrograd in 1917. Attempts at repression were met with blatant defiance. Strikes ripped through industry after industry. Military rule was instituted, but to no avail, as the, Irani, uh, the army's loyalty began to evaporate. In January 1979, the Shah was forced to leave Iran. And in the end, it was the workers and peasants, the ordinary people of the, in the streets of Iran, who had brought down the Shah. Yet in the fi these final days of the Shah's rule, the Fedayeen emerged from the countryside during the tail end of the revolution. There were still armed forces in Tehran, the capital, loyal to the Shah, who refused to stand down and hope for a last minute coup d'etat. The Fedayeen and the armed people went into battle, successfully seizing armories and barracks, and distributing their captured arms to the masses. And after the revolution, it was unclear who would rule Iran. There were the secular liberals from the Mossadegh, the Judea who still had prestige. The popular Khomeini returned from exile. Workers were forming their own councils, and there was, of course, the Fedayeen. You now, it's beyond the scope of this talk to give a full accounting of the Iranian revolution, but a few words can and must be said on it. After the overthrow of the Shah, Ayatollah Khomeini proved to be victorious. He was able to unite behind him the national bourgeoisie with his defense of Iran's industry. Gullible sections of the rest left with his fierce opposition to American imperialism, conservatives and clergy with his opposition to secularism and the revolutionary left, and poor masses with his promise of freeing them from dependent capitalism and Islamic promises of social justice. And by the 1980s, Khomeini established a theocratic national bourgeoisie, independent of the USA, true, but maintained by a white terror that suppressed national minorities and the left. Following the revolution, the Fedayeen were the largest left current with support in the universities and sections of the working class. Their popularity was clear in demonstrations, in which half a million would march in their support and during initial elections where they received around 10% of the vote. Their program was in opposition to a national bourgeoisie, a bourgeois regime and in favor of a people's democracy and socialism. Yet they made a number of key tactical errors which prevented them from seizing the opportunities opened by the revolution. For one, the Fedayeen maintained an ambivalent attitude toward the Shoras, which were Iranian workers' councils or Soviets, that had spread across the country in the aftermath of the revolution. The Shoras represented the potential power of the working class, which could have been harnessed and centralized by a vanguard a party to push the revolution in a radical direction. Well, the Fedayeen did not dismiss the Shoras the way that Judea did. They looked at them mainly as recruiting grounds for their organization. Uh, the Judea who looked at them mainly as recruiting grounds for their organization and ignored the potential of proletariat power they represented. Splits uh, within the left and a coordinated assault by the Islamic Republic on the councils and the workers' movement meant that the shores were effectively brought to heel within a few years. And if anyone had been through Occupy movements, a sim similar situation, all these groups would be in the shores trying to push it or recruit people to it uh, co-opted, mm -hmm. well, the workers were trying to organize a strike and had no idea what was going on among those people. Now, part of the reason that some of the Judea and the wider left did not wholeheartedly support the Shores was because they genuinely believed that Khomeini was a progressive anti-imperialist. Therefore, any worker demands which threatened Khomeini or the progressive uh, national bourgeoisie were opposed by the wide sections of the left, especially the Judea. The Judea was second to none and wanting to strip the shores of any revolutionary content and make them strictly sub, uh, trade union bodies in support of the Islamic Republic. The Judea position toward the Islamic Republic was outlined by their General Secretary Kananori as follows. I quote, We have criticized the establishment. We made criticism of the position of liberty in the state and about the rights of women. We've criticized Islamic fanaticism. We're against the non-progressive ideas of these conservative elements. But for us, the positive side of Ayatollah Khomeini is so important that the negative side means nothing. We think he is an obstacle to fanaticism. He's more progressive than other elements. Following the revolution, 
the Fedayeen also support over whether to support the Islamic Republic. A majority faction of the Fedayeen, closely allied with the Judea, came out with their own position of critical support for the anti-imperialist Islamic Republic. However, a minority, a minority of the Fedayeen saved the honor of Marxism in Iran by opposing the Islamic Republic. What followed the split in the Fedayeen was perhaps one of the most shameful history uh, episodes in the history of the left. The Judea and the Fedayeen majority condemned the, the minority faction as counter-revolutionary and openly collaborated with the Islamic Republic by handing over inside information on the minor, minority faction, such as names of members, which led to their arrest and execution. Such a generous service provided by the Tudea and the, and the majority faction to the Islamic Republic did not stop their own suppression by 1983. A further humiliation was inflicted on the Tudea when its leaders were forced to confess to heinous crimes during public show trials. The Fedayeen minority and the Kurdish left, who was also active during this time, found they had to take to the hills once more again to fight the Islamic Republic, this at the same time as a war with Iraq was developed. Yet divisions in their ranks and, repressive force, and the repressive force of the state prevented them from being able to mount a lasting challenge. And a moving story of communist opposition was also provided by the Maoist Communist Party of Iran, Sarbid Iran, which me literally means those who are about to be hanged, mm -hmm. uh, who launched an armed struggle in the city of Amal in 1982. And this bold move resulted in the capture and execution of at least 250 militants. And if, you, if you're on Facebook and you've seen the event page, I actually have a really nice picture of them right before they're about to go into battle and die with fists held high. It's a moving picture, but it's kind of eerie to look at. In the late 1980s, the prisons of Iran were filled with socialists and communists that were eventually uh, emptied in a mass execution of thousands, d depending on your source, four or 5,000 to 30,000. Despite the ferocious, uh, ferocious repression, this was not the end of the left in Iran. Small remnants of the Fedayeen, both minority and majority, and other groups do remain in exile. And though it is illegal to be a Marxist in Iran, there are still underground worker and socialist groups. So in lieu of a conclusion, since the struggle is still ongoing, I'd like to say the following. People like Bazan Jazani, the Fedayeen guerrillas, and thousands of socialist communists and thousands of revolutionary workers and peasants fought and died for a socialist revolution in Iran. It is true that they made many mistakes, some dishonorable and unforgivable, but they also gave all they had for a noble cause. And these are the true heroes of the Iranian revolution, not the religious reactionaries who hijacked their revolution and had them murdered. Thank you. Questions, comments, concerns, objections? John. Well, I remember those days. Yeah. It was unfolding, the masses were mobilizing, the regime was going to fall, uh, the Shah left, and the Fadayan, Fadayin went into the streets. There were tens of thousands of them. I thought, well, all right, you know, something's going to happen. And the, actually, uh, maybe within a day or two, the women came out. Mm. All right, tens of thousands of women. And they said, the revolution ain't over. That was right. the slogan, all right. And they weren't wearing the veils. <laughs> and it was uh, it was a genuine revolution. It was hijacked by the clerics. Uh, the uh, the Fadayan, you know, in some ways they uh, they reverted back to sort of a Stalinist policy. You know, it's turning in of an opposing faction to the the, uh, the clerics and having them executed. This, and that's not the first time that kind of thing has happened. Uh, you know, you can look at Asia and places. Oh, sure. But anyway, uh, you know, everyone had high hopes for the Iranian Revolution. It was, uh, it was quite a... There were also, uh, you know, there were other underground revolutionary groups that functioned throughout the 80s. They couldn't do much of anything. Uh, you know, could argue amongst themselves. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was locked down pretty tight. The, uh, but there were small groups that oriented specifically to the Shores. And, you know, I was yeah. reading about it back then. That the Shores, you know, from my point of view, were, this was what the, this was going to be the vehicle of the masses. 
and you know I'm sitting here thousands of miles away, and, but there were groups very small that were orienting in that direction, but they did not have the, the support in, in the history of the Fadayan over there. Uh, but yeah, they, I, I just think that you know they were they were how to put it they were they were hobbled by uh, you know, sort of a, a Stalinist legacy that eventually led to their defeat. I just want before I take I just wanted to say a few things. It's true that a section of the Fedayeen, as I said, did support uh, Khomeini and the national bourgeoisie. But if it's a Stalinist uh, error, a lot of the Trotskyists in Iran fell into the same thing. I was talking to a friend who told me, like, I don't even know what Trotskyist factions, so don't ask me. One of them changed their slogan from Workers of the World Unite to Allah Akbar. Oh. You know, it's like, um, so some, no, some Trotskyists did oppose the Islamic Republic. That's true. I'm not denying that by any means. But some of them did back it. So if it's a Stalinist era, a lot of them fell into it, too. Yeah, yeah. I'm sort of going along with that. Um, I, I'm wondering if Ghazani and his people ever um, elucidated a, a program because, I mean, I understand in terms of the, looking at the method of the form of the revolution, you know, the form of the revolution, they went to Marigay and Lenny Che and yeah. do, do, do. But it seems to me they're thinking, you know, two stage theory versus, you know, transition program. Yes, they, they are. I mean, one thing that comes up in a lot of my readings on the left and around, even the very sympathetic ones, is like the poverty of like Marxist theory among a lot of. Uh, a lot of these groups, a lot of them would just be like reading these really bad Soviet textbooks and regurgitating that, which, you know, they wouldn't have, like, have access to a lot of like texts and everything. And that, that's in a certain way understandable considering the repression, both the Shah and, and everything. Jazani, you know, if you read his writings, which, you know, I, I read Capitalism and Revolution in Iran, it's clear that he's making use of Mao. You know, he like primary, secondary contradictions, and he understands a lot of Marx and Lenin. But a lot of these uh, theorists, I, I mean, it's not very theoretically vigorous. Like, like if they, you know, I, you're talking about transitional programs. You know, if they're reading these Soviet textbooks, Trotsky's either irrelevant or he's a fascist agent or something stupid like that. So essentially, there was no program. I mean, they did. I mean, Jazani, like I said, did have a program, and I mean, the first stage of the revolution was essentially break the chains of dependency and establish like independence from imperialism, but under a communist or working class government, and to eventually go to uh, socialism. But it was not like he did not envision, for instance, having the the national bourgeoisie in control by any means, and neither did the initially the other faction of the Fed. Bourgeoisie here certainly would have, you know, per, you know, preferred Khomeini over. Uh, um, they actually really didn't like Khomeini. Either. No, they don't. But what yeah. Do you think they oh yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the American, the American yeah. bourgeoisie. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about that. This should be the kind of thing that I know about, but I don't. Did the Americans have like a contingency plan for what they would do if Iran actually went communist? I mean, I they, they obviously weren't pleased with what actually happened, but they didn't. I, from reading from the period, they just didn't, you know, the American defense establishment just like didn't have, you know, Islamist rebels taking over. That didn't. I don't, that didn't I don't think them. anyone expected that. And yeah. Whenever I read something on this, it's like, oh, maybe the Marxists will come in, maybe the secular liberals, but Khomeini or this, yeah. these Islamic groups so that was kind of seemed as pretty far fetched. Yeah. And that might have been why, like, all this repression was directed under the Shah against either these liberal nationalists yeah. or communist groups, you know, because they were effectively like crushed. Yeah. I mean, the repression was ferocious. But I'm wondering if the US would have been, I mean, I don't know what it would have done, but I well, can't imagine that a red Iran would be something no, they I mean, stand for. Iran does or at that time bordered the Soviet Union. Yeah. And by the time the revolution in Iran happened, I think the Soviet Union had just moved into Afghanistan next yeah. door. So that would have uh, that would have been pretty it would have given you know, the Soviet Union through, you know, assuming that Iran allied to the Soviet Union, 
it would have been access to what was the Red Sea right there? Uh, no, the, the Persian Gulf. Persian Gulf. I can't even think. But yeah, the Persian Gulf. That's assuming Iran would have allied to the Soviet Union. But um, I, I don't think they really did have a contingency plan. Basically. Yeah, I think the World War Three. Yeah. The other thing was like the U.S. did back Iraq. Yeah, this period against Iran. Yeah, so it's like within a, a year or two of the revolution, uh, Iran and Iraq were at war for the next eight years. Yeah. And initially, I think both the mi minority and majority kind of, you know, they saw like the country's in danger from Iraq, so they kind of backed it. The minority quickly pulled out, and uh, but the, neither faction of the Fedayeen, like, uh, it, none of that support mattered ultimately. Yeah. There's somebody else. I'm on my second time. Oh, I mean, if well, yeah. Another very uh, a large prominent group was the Mujahideen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, they were sort of leftist uh, Islam Islamics. They were very religious and they were very much to the left. Oh, yeah, that's true. And they, uh, you know, they weren't going to stand for the, uh, you know, the policies of the regime. They went into open opposition during the war, and they they were. Uh, Jailed, slaughtered. I mean, there were lots of them. You know, eventually, a lot of them escaped and uh, kind of uh, stayed in Iraq, <laughs> which didn't, you know, do them too well in, in terms of uh, their, their political orientation. But, uh, but they were. I remember, you know, they were known all over the world as part of a very large uh, military opposition to the to the Khomeini regime. So they were they were big players as well as the yeah uh, but uh, there's another well the with the Mujahideen they were right before I get to you uh, they were formed in like the late 60s and 70s and you're right they were left Islamics there were some factions of the Mujahideen who when they were all imprisoned like a lot of the religious people refused to sit with the quote unquote unclean leftists they would they would actually, you know, sit with them. And some of them were so influenced by Marx's theory that some factions openly called themselves Marxist-Leninists. And, um, you know, some factions, I believe, split and went towards Khomeini. A lot of them opposed them. And I think in 1982, they actually bombed, like, the leadership of, like, the Islamic Republic and killed a bunch of them. But it should be said about the Mujahideen, like, they've since dropped pretty much all that Marxism-Leninism, and a lot of the I think the big faction that's left is actually a U.S. sponsored group at this point. So, um, you know, that's turning into its opposite, I guess. But, um, yeah, I mean, they were a very interesting group, and, you know, they were one of the bigger groups at the time. Yes, Ephraim, you had a question? I think the leftist movement in the communist and socialist parties in Iran felt that eliminated by the war with Iran. The Iran war against Iran was supported by the United States. Might have, like sections of that might have been supported by Saddam Hussein, I'll grant you that, but neither faction of the Fedayeen and certainly not the Judea party were supported by Saddam Hussein or imperialism. I mean, they, these were people who were facing severe repression and being massacred. They were not supported by imperialism. And it should be said, during the Iran-Iraq war, there was the whole Iran-Contra scandal where the U.S. was, you know, engage in all these illicit dealings with Iran to fund their own terrorists in, in Nicaragua. You know, so they had no problem, you know, doing business with Iran, you know, if it suited their interests. But, I mean, I actually wanted to, since John and Sandy had both said about how back in the 70s this was a big deal, and I was speaking to a friend at last week's uh, big rally, and he said, yeah, well, it's like these are not obscure people. Like, these were big names at the time. And I agree. I mean, like, a lot of you are older than me, so you remember this. But um, my point is, the reason why I thought this was important, that you have large sections of the left for 
understandable reasons they don't want the U.S. to attack Iran. I mean, it's good reasons. I mean, I don't want the U.S. to attack Iran. I don't want the U.S. to attack anywhere. But that take gets taken a step too far, as far as I'm concerned, to open apologeta and support for a theocracy, a theocracy, a religious state that has massacred our comrades. And I don't think that's acceptable by any means. You know, it's one thing to say you don't want the U.S. to bomb any country. That's fine. I'll, I'll stand with you. But it's another thing to defend a theocratic government run by its own local capitalist class. I'm not going to do that. And I'd rather honor these people who fought for a revolution as opposed to honoring their executioners. And it's, yeah, so... Because even people who are older than me will tell me, it's like, I don't know anything about the left in Iran. Because a lot of the debate is over, like, you know, current tactics in anti-war coalitions or whatnot, which is important, but a lot of this gets buried. And if I have any privilege whatsoever, it's, or any responsibility, it's maybe to uh, remind people of this history. I think one of the contradictions of the Atola regime is it also lives in science and technology. Uh, Iran is right now is one of the most powerful states in the region. Yeah. And uh, they spend so much money on the military industrial complex. So I don't think it's a well entrenched uh, political power and it's not going to be easy to wage a revolution in Iran. I, I, yeah, I mean, that, I, I'm not going to be. I, but it's going to be formidably uh, challenging, even if the United States uh, engage in a military attack against Iran. It's going to be a major war. In oh, sure. Yeah. And uh, the state of Israel will be in a very bad shape, really, because the country is well armed. The military program is financed locally, and uh, it's, it's, it's really sophisticated. Something, something, uh, yeah, I, first of all, to get to some of that, uh, something I, I actually didn't mention was the Shah did support Israel. It's like one of the, the big pillars of U.S. support in the region was the Shah, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. And Khomeini did not support Israel. Like, you, you'll see pictures of, like, it's either the Revolutionary Guard or the Republican Guard who will march over, like, pictures of, like, the Israeli flag and the American flag. And actually, I think the Soviet flag, too. Because they were, they, you know, they were anti-Israel. Yeah. Israel. Right. yeah. And, uh, I mean, but there is, there, like, as recently as it's either 2009 or 2012, there were big demonstrations in Iran over the presidential elections there. You know, whether it was stolen or not, I can't say. But there was big demonstrations there. And there is a big underground labor movement that exists. You know, I, can point, I can point you to certain, uh, some, well, a lot of stuff I've read is like maybe 10 years old, but it's the point you take. From what I can tell, they have the reverse problem to us, where uh, resistance to the regime, the, the Mullah regime, is seen as kowtowing to the US. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas here on the left, we see, you know, you wind up with people apologizing for the Ayatollahs when really, when what they're opposed to is U.S. imperialism, but what you get over there is people basically doing the reverse by saying, oh, you're, you're going, you're, you're supporting the Americans, you're supporting the people who are eventually going to attempt to overthrow, who are going to, you know, try to bring back imperialism, whatever else, um, you know, you have to say. Yeah, I mean, if we were in Iran having this conversation, first of all, we wouldn't be taping it. It wouldn't be this open. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it would be a lot different, uh, you know, how to manage those contradictions. Yeah. And well, something I, I probably really should have spoken more of, like, the condition of women has, in, I would arguably, has improved, it, like, since probably the 70s. It's still, like, not that great. A lot of things are not that great. The Kurdish population does not live in that great position. But uh, a big failing of the left was failing to support the, the women's movements that happened like after the overthrow of the Shah, and they refused to wear the veil, as uh, John said. And a lot of leftists said, you know, you're going against our progressive anti-imperialist leaders and that. Mm. That didn't work out too well, you know, as understandably. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you could, if, uh, I don't know if your research is came up to the present, but what is the state of the, the, the left in Iran now? Who are the, you know, who's up hiding in the countryside? You know, I mean, I've read a little about this, uh, the, the Worker Communist Party, which 
seems to do some work around the curves and spread his way rack a little, but they seem to devolved into a bunch of splits. And, uh, I don't really know who's, who's left. Yeah, a lot of these groups still exist. Like the Today exists, both Fedayeen factions, a lot of Maoist groups. And normally when we, when we look at the far left of a country and we see all the splits, you know, you start with maybe one party and it splits into a million of them, it's like it's normally a bunch of Trotskyist groups, right? Iran is actually much different in the sense like most of these groups are all self-described Marxist-Leninists, and there's like maybe 60 or 80 of them. There's very few Trotskyist groups in Iran, at least as far as I know. There is the worker communists who, they're very, like they do not like the Islamic Republic, they do do work among the Kurds. A lot of their sections in exile is like based on what I've read, they kind of fall into a lot of Islamophobia, and that's problematic. It's one thing to oppose the, the government of Iran, that's, you know, whatever. It's another thing to f fall into Islamophobia. Like, uh, the, the Ma there are still Maoist groups there, but a lot of these groups are in exile for obvious reasons. Uh, it seems like there's, you know, there is an underground trade u union movement that I would consider more syndicalist, like a lot of them don't, are not are very distrustful of a lot of parties, you know, for a lot of understandable reasons. I don't know, like, because it's very hard to get, like, good information on a lot of this. But uh, all, a lot of these groups do exist, and uh, some, like, I know, like, the Maoist groups, uh, who were actually part of RIM, I believe, back the, uh, the, the protests in, like, 2009, and I don't know their physical strength. It's very hard to get information. What do you mind, uh, was in Iran during the revolution, he, uh, he was around the Parayin, Parayan, uh, Parayin. Uh, and uh, I don't know why I call it the Parayan, but anyway. Tomato, tomato, tomato. Yeah, uh, and his mother, you know, he was a student, his mother uh, decided that you know, given the circumstances and his evolution, that she was going to get the hell out of the country and, and dragged him with her. <laughs> and that's probably why he's alive today. But what, what he knows, uh, you know, when he goes home and stuff, it's, you know, people like 30 years old and under, you know, are just increasingly in mass becoming alienated from religion. You know, yes. It's not a question of not liking Islam. It's like the people raised in the Catholic family, you know, they, they don't turn to Protestantism <laughs> or anything. <laughs> they just junk the whole mess. Uh, but there's a lot of that going on among young people in Iran. They, uh, they've had enough religion. Yeah, uh, you know that's kind of threatening the, uh, the the foundations of the Islamic rule there. I mean, yeah, a lot of the population I believe is like under thirty or forty. It's like a large percentage, and you know, there had like I said, there've been student protests again, like uh, with the election of Ahmadinejad in like oh nine ten, and even back to like two thousand one too. There's been a lot of uh, you know there was a lot of student protests. And there is actually there is a workers' movement there too. Like they, a lot of the strikes, bring, a lot of the strikes are illegal, but it still exists. And they have got like the the national bourgeoisie there has got very wealthy on a lot of oil profits, and they do have relations with like France and Britain still. Like they don't obviously with the United States that's very different, but you know they have they have enriched themselves, and you know. It is a, it is a capitalist regime with Islamic colors, you know, whatever else you want to put it. But does anyone else have questions about this or any of the other talks? Um, just briefly, I'm going to pass around the donation jug. Yes. Donate to the CME. So next month, uh, unless someone has questions about this or any other talks, next month is Tanya Bunk on the. Um, on Bolivia, uh, South America in the 60s, and then Bukharan in July. So thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks, John.